the creme de la creme. I've met you over the year. That's so cool. I've been here about a year and a half now. Oh, okay, hold on one second, Barbara. Okay. Can you just hit okay on the... Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, you're fine. Uh, yes, got it. Uh... There we go. All right. Um, so welcome, everybody. This uh, program is brought to you by the library, Millinocket Memorial Library, and A Trendly Millinocket. And it's part of an overall effort to break down stereotypes about aging and the aging brain to allay some anxieties we all have. We're all getting older, things we don't want to think about, loss of brain function. But there are many, many positive things that we can do to, to diffuse that anxiety and to help people we know who are already struggling with it or their loved ones. So today's presentation, we're thrilled to have Susan Mary, MD. She's a physician, an educator, and she's the um, Associate Clinical Professor of Geriatrics at the College of Osteopathic Medicine at the University of New England. And she has 35 years of experience. Uh, you can make that 40. <laughs> <laughs> She's reading from an old bio. <laughs> and I should have updated. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Um, and she she works with students, policymakers, health and human service professionals, older adults, family caregivers. And she's been going around giving this presentation, doing a Q&A, and bringing, she brought some wonderful door prizes for us, a manual about living with um, helpful hints for living with dementia or thinking about early dementia or what people, what goes through people's minds. If they have dementia that will help you with your friends or family, just so many different levels of uh, expertise and interest. So um, we're thrilled to present Dr. Susan Mary. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Barbara. And I want to take my hats off to Age Friendly and to the library for allowing us to come. And thanks to all of you for actually being here today. Um, I I'm so glad that you are here because what I am learning is uh, how much anxiety and dementia worry is out there. And it's been made worse in some ways by all of the television advertising telling us to buy this or that pill um, to protect against dementia. So this talk actually came into being when my student who couldn't be here today, Grace Simonson, came to me about six months ago and said, can you tell me something to help my mother? And I said, I don't know, what's wrong with her? And she said, she is so worried about getting dementia. My grandmother had it, my mother's sister had it, my great aunt has it, and my mother is sure that she's going to get it. And she's just so worried. And I said, well, you know, um, there is no guarantee that because your grandmother had it, that she's going to get it. And there are some things she can do to protect her brain. So we decided to put together this talk to share helpful tips with everybody and to explain the difference between the normal changes that happen as we get older and those that are more worrisome, like dementia. And that's kind of how it came to be. And um, my goal today is really to give you the facts, to educate you some, and I hope that it will reduce any worry that you might have about getting dementia. And my bigger hope is that it will increase your confidence in your ability to do something about it, okay? It's a big set of goals, but I think that we can do it together. Now, let me tell you some of the things that I think interfere with people's confidence now. One is that I'm afraid we're kind of an ageist society by which I mean we prefer some ages more than others. We're kind of a big youth-focused society, for one, and as there turn out to be more and more, of uh, those of us who are older, people sometimes aren't sure what to do about us. 
By the same token, many older adults in my experience have kind of bought into the myths about aging. How many times have you heard somebody say when they misplace something, oh, having a senior moment, <laughs> okay? And it's kind of a joke that's built into our usual language, right? As if all forgetting was somehow related to age. You know, my dear mother who died just two years ago at the age of 97, completely cognitively intact, used to joke with me all the time um, when I entered this field and was working with people living with dementia. And she said to me one time, I don't know how you are ever going to know if you have dementia. I said, why? And she said, because you've been losing things since you were six years old. <laughs> and it's true. I don't, I'm don't. i a little bit of your classic absent-minded professor. I misplace things all the time, and I have since the first day of kindergarten. So I'm going to have to look for other clues to see, to explain it. But what I do know is that we can sometimes be our own worst enemies if we think we're too old to learn, or it's too late to change our ways, or that we're too old to get healthy, because that's just not true. And that's what I mean by ageism. The other thing that kind of gets in the way, I think, is anxiety about getting old, anxiety about dying, anxiety about dementia. And if you remember any time from a grade school up to your highest level of education, you'll remember that on those days that you were nervous about taking a test, you probably did worse. Anxiety always interferes with our learning. So if you tend to be anxious, I'm going to ask you to just kind of put that worry aside, see what you can learn today, so that's not in the way. And then finally, you may have heard about this thing called a pandemic, <laughs> old COVID-19. Well, it hit us hard in a couple of ways. One, for people who got COVID, some of them got long COVID and developed brain fog. Other people, even if they never had COVID, had to deal with the quarantine, the masks, the isolation, the disruption in all of our lives from the things we're used to, funerals, weddings, birthday parties. It was a very disrupted time. And it took a toll actually on our brains. So as a psychiatrist, as you heard, with a lot of experience, the thing that people ask me all the time, normal, healthy, well-adjusted people, is this brain fog ever going away? So many people find their brains just aren't working as well as they would like. So after today, I hope everybody's gonna realize there's so much we can do to take good care of our brains. So here's what I'd like you to know. As we age, our brain power, our brain function, what you sometimes hear is cognitive function, does decline. So if you have noticed that you're a little slower, if you have noticed that it takes more trials, more repetitions to memorize something, it's probably true. As we age, our brain processing speed slows down. It's We are slower to recall things and it's harder to learn new things. But overall learning is still possible. I often say to people like this, when I was a kid, we used to play this game at birthday parties where they would put 10 items on a tray. Did some of you play that also? Yeah, and they, right? It was fun. And they uh, bring it in and they show it to all the kids and then you have like less than a minute. And then the mom walks out of the room with the tray and you have to write down how many things you remember, okay? When you're, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 years old, you can remember 10 out of 10 pretty effortlessly, maybe eight out of 10 for some, but it's a pretty easy thing to do. When you get to be 80 and you play that same game, 
you'll maybe remember five in that one minute. But here's the trick. If they bring the tray back and you get a second crack at it and you get two minutes instead of one minute, your learning shoots up to seven out of 10. Huh. And if they bring the tray back a third time, you can get 10 out of 10. This is what older people don't understand. Our brains do work differently, but they work well. It's just that in our fast paced age, we tend to want everything to go like this. And when our kids, our grandkids are showing us how to do something on the computer, they want it to go like this. They don't know that we're like playing to a new beat. You know, it's a different rhythm, but it still works. And that's what you need to know. If you're having trouble memorizing something, say you like to memorize poetry and you're finding it hard, that's probably true. It doesn't mean anything's wrong with your brain. It means that you got to work harder at it. That's really what we mean by more repetition and slower. The other thing that happens with age, though, is that we are smarter. Our knowledge improves. And in fact, going back to COVID for a moment, even though anxiety and depression were very high among all age groups, older adults coped better than any other age group through the pandemic. Why? Because we've already seen a lot. The young students were freaking out. Now, and I'm not talking young like grade school, I'm talking about college students. They didn't know what to do, right? We knew what to do, not exactly, but we knew that we'd been through something, we knew how to cope, we knew how to kind of mitigate or, you know, um, solve the problems that were put in front of us. And so you also have to keep in mind that while memory decline is real, slower and more repetitions, the ease of recall is not as easy. You're smarter now than you have ever been. And that's really important for you to keep in mind. Now that change in memory, that's put 10 things on a tray, try to remember it, see how good you are, that decline in memory is measurable at about age 35. We think of it as a grade <laughs> problem. We think of it as just happening when we're older, when that's when we notice it. But actually when psychologists study it, we start slowing down long before we ever even care. So I say it not to say it's not a big deal. I do a lot of this kind of teaching, and it is annoying to me when I can't find the word I want, when it doesn't quite come to me, right? And so I get annoyed. I can live with annoyance. Because here's the problem. If every time I can't remember a word, I panic or get anxious, if I were to do that, that word would never come. If I just wait, it will come. And if people around you weren't always saying, that's the word or trying to fill in the blank for you, right? It would come for you as well. That's what I mean about keep come on in. We're glad to have you. Sorry, I'm no, no worries at all. You're right on time. Um, you won't do as well on the quiz, of course. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and the other thing I want to say about, you know, when we talk about dementia when you hear about it people mostly focus on memory or remembering but I want you to think bigger than that more broadly than that okay and I want you to know that when we talk about cognition or cognitive ability we're really talking about brain power which is about thinking problem solving doing math remembering using language all of it up there making decisions and even somebody with dementia, say due to Alzheimer's disease, does not lose function in all areas equally or at the same rate. To put it a little differently, even somebody with Alzheimer's disease who cannot remember that they have been asking the same question 
over and over and over for the last five minutes may be perfectly able to find their way home, have no problems in orientation, may still have good attention skills. It's just the short-term memory is shy, okay? So the goal there becomes to find some workarounds. And that's why it's important for you to know not everything is about memory. And we have such robustly formed brains the older we get, meaning that we've lived through so much, we know so much that we have to remind ourselves that we can probably figure workarounds to our deficits that we no longer like. Now there's another category of change that happens called mild cognitive impairment. You'll hear this called MCI. And MCI is a decline in function that bugs us more. That's the best way to put it. It doesn't really interfere with your day-to-day -day function, but you have a feeling that it is a little worse than other people your age and that you think your decline might be a little steeper. And if you go get tested, it probably is for it to be called MCI, or mild cognitive impairment. Now, here's the thing for you to know about MCI. If you, if, if uh, your primary care doctor tells you you have mild cognitive impairment on the test, one of three things can happen. It can get worse and turn into dementia, it can get better and go back to your pre-MCI functioning before you were ever diagnosed, or it can stay absolutely the same and never get any worse. And that's really important to know because a lot of people, when they get MCI, they think, oh my God, now I'm gonna get dementia. Maybe, some people will, but about a third of people will get better. Another third will stay the same. And about a third go on to develop dementia. This ADRD is Alzheimer's disease and related disorders. You've probably seen that before. And when we talk about dementia, we're really talking about a syndrome. It's an umbrella term. It's a big term used to describe a range of symptoms associated with cognitive decline, right? A loss of power, if you will, or a loss of ability in each of those areas that we mentioned. Remembering, thinking, problem solving, doing math, painting pictures, finding your way home, whatever. When we use the word dementia, it means that it has gotten enough worse that it's starting to interfere with your day-to-day -day life. That's what dementia is. The most common cause of dementia is Alzheimer's disease. That's why you've heard so much about Alzheimer's for years. It's one kind of dementia, but it's not the only kind. The next uh, most common kind is called vascular dementia. And it's what used to be called hardening of the arteries. It used to, used to be called senility, had these other names. And it was really just due to decreased blood flow in the brain. Now that we know that, we've upgraded our terminology, and so it's vascular. That means the vessels, the blood flow to the brain is interfered with in some way. So you have these little mini strokes from little clots or whatever, ischemia we call it. So little parts of the brain die. In contrast to Alzheimer's, the blood flow may be okay, but the brain cells themselves are dying, neurodegeneration. Lewy body is another kind of dimension you hear about sometimes, and frontotemporal. Now, as you heard, I've been at this a while. And so I have lived through a really interesting period in my field, right? When I first started in, or when I was a medical student and then went on to do my residency, I was really interested in the brain. Still am. And I went into neuropsychiatry. That was my chosen, chosen field. But my professors were not very supportive. I really liked 
older adults long before I ever became one. And so I've just always like being around old people. What can I say? But there was such a belief among physicians that there was nothing you could do for old people with respect to their brain, that you can't teach an old dog new tricks, that they're set in their ways, that they don't want to learn. I mean, I can't tell you how many like negative um, myths um, I was exposed to and how little support I had for going into this field. People say, oh, please don't waste your time. Don't waste your skills. Don't that like so I'm glad I didn't listen. But in the 1980s, that was really kind of the way we thought about dementia, the way we thought about aging brains. We thought depression and dementia were inevitable, nothing you could do, this whole sort of doom and gloom talk. In the 1990s, as I go through my own career, I really just see evidence of this. There was a wonderful book published by a couple of guys, Roe and Kahn, called Successful Aging. And in that book, they discovered that actually we could impact the way we aged. And you see this whole new positive aging movement. You see, before Roland Kahn did their research, what the joke among gerontologists was, if you want to age well, choose your parents wisely. <laughs> because we thought it was all in the genes. And if you had a really old parent, you're like, yes, I'm going to live a long time. And if you didn't, you're like, oh, no. But we found out that actually lifestyle makes a difference. Some of it is due to genes, but more of it is due to lifestyle choices, health habits, what we eat, how we live, and then some to chance, to luck, bad or good. Through the 2000s to the current day, we have been increasingly focused on two things, finding a cure for Alzheimer's disease, which has been, I think, gotten most of the attention, and looking for drugs that might be helpful. As we get to the, two, to the 2020s, um, there has been another um, development, though, that has emerged, and that is non-drug strategies for improving brain health. Non-drug strategies for living with dementia. You know, in my tradition, um, I'm an allopathic physician, meaning that I'm an MD. And so in our tradition, our job is to find disease, find what causes the disease, treat it, try to make it go away. It had this very acute care cure kind of focus. But the truth is, if you have an illness or a disease, a lot of them become chronic. Diabetes, high blood pressure, osteoarthritis, COPD, or what used to be called emphysema. These are chronic conditions. And what we mostly do in our lives is try to avoid them and then learn how to live with them so that it doesn't have to interfere with our quality of life. So people have all kinds of illnesses that they live with, but that way of thinking is only newly being applied to living well with dementia. And what's happening now as people get diagnosed earlier and earlier, you may live with dementia due to Alzheimer's disease for 12, 15, 20 years. And there is absolutely no reason not to have high quality of life during those 15, 20 years. And that I think is what is new. And so one of my research projects now is working on optimal engagement of people living with dementia. Like what really does help? What really does work? What do people with dementia like to do? And how can we help them make adaptations to do it? And one of the things that we started doing was to partner with Age Friendly and lifelong learning communities to say, hey, let's include people more with dementia, make the adaptations in our community to help uh, make it possible for them to live well with us. So that's kind of where, where we've gone. Now, you hear a lot about drugs. I'm going to say just a word or two, but I'm happy to, to answer questions about them. In the early days of my career, 
the biggest so-called breakthrough was with this drug called Aricept or a generic name Danepazil. And that drug was supposed to slow Alzheimer's down. And in the beginning, it appeared, may, maybe it did by a little bit. For some people, it seemed to slow it down by a lot. So some people have had good success with it. But from a scientist standpoint or a physician standpoint, if you see a whole lot of people, as opposed to the one or two that it helps, what you see more of is that it has been kind of disappointing. Another drug, different mechanism, memantine, came along. Um, and memantine also maybe helped a little bit, but nothing has been really all that exciting in terms of drug approaches to treating dementia. The latest controversy surrounds the newest drugs, which are called the mobs. And they're called the mob drugs because it, it's short for monoclonal antibody therapies, okay, monoclonal antibodies. And they are based on a hypothesis about, well, what causes Alzheimer's disease? Some people think that what causes Alzheimer's disease is a buildup of something called amyloid in the brain. And that's what the drug companies would like you to believe, that it's that simple. I wish that it were. We have been hotly pursuing the amyloid hypothesis for 30 years. We have been giving drug upon drug, trying to suck the amyloid out. And it's been very disappointing. Most serious scientists, including right here in Maine at Jack Jackson Labs, are trying to get the message out that it's more complicated than that. It's not as simple as one protein, namely amyloid. And, um, and I think that as a clinician, I'm not a research scientist, but I think as a clinician, what troubles me is selling people more hype and maybe some false hope. What, the, what others say, to give you like a fair and balanced uh, read on this, what others say is, well, the only reason it doesn't work is we're not catching people early enough. So if we catch people in very early stages, or maybe before they even have symptoms, but what kind of disease is that? But <laughs> catch them before they have symptoms. Um, and, uh, and then maybe if we try that, we could prevent more Alzheimer's from happening. That would be great. That would be great. We could just all take educanumab, <laughs> just in case. Just in we could case. say, ah, no, I think I like the chem B better. Or the next one that's going to come along is going to be the next mob is denanumab. And so we could say, well, sure. You know, well, why not try it? Not my grandmother had it. My mother had it. My grandpa, you know. It makes sense. And that's what the advertisers are going to tell you. What they're not going to tell you is that these drugs cause brain bleeds and brain swelling. 27% of people who took these drugs, 27, okay, had swelling of their brain and micro hemorrhages. Okay? So that's what they don't tell you. Um, and yet, what I also always say to people is, when people are diagnosed with a, an aggressive cancer, people take drugs quite often, have radiation. It causes their hair to fall out. It causes all kinds of GI or gastrointestinal bleeding. It's not that we don't ever take drugs that hurt, that are toxic, right? That cause all kinds of bad side effects. That happens. But in this case, it's for this much maybe benefit. In contrast, some cancer drugs that are also pretty hard on the, the rest of the non-cancer body, you might get a cure, you might get a slowdown, you might go into remission and say, I'm going to take my chances because if it works, it's going to work big. This drug, if it works, is going to improve your score on a test by a half a point. 
okay? You will get worse slower. Let me put that to tell you what these are really like. When drug companies set up a drug study, they give people tests, right? Before and after kinds of tests. And then they do some intervention like Adjuhelm or one of the others, and then they retest people. People who got placebo went from, now this, I'm, these numbers I'm making up, but I wanna show you the scale. Let's say, and, and by the way, all of these people have dementia already, okay? So all these people have dementia, early stages, then let's say that they both get a score of 10 on some test. Let's say a person without dementia might get 15, but the people with dementia only get 10. So you start off two groups, and you give one a drug and you give the other one nothing, a placebo, an inactive drug. Six months later, you test them again. The group that did not get the drug has dropped down to an eight, whereas the people who got the drug have only dropped down to 8.5, okay? Not very impressive. And there is no evidence that has real effect on a day-to-day -day life. So it's not that the FDA didn't look at the data. They did. But they set it up to say, well, we're going to call it statistically significant if it has this much percentage change. It did. Fair's fair. They approved it. And now clinicians are faced with this dilemma of people who um, because the message has been all doom and gloom, are desperate to try something. And the something um, can cause very serious harm. So it's problematic. And um, and I think you're going to hear more about it just in the paper, sort of on TV, because um, folks from the Alzheimer's Association have a very different opinion than the one I've been giving. They They think you know, if anything would help, it's worth a try. And so they kind of downplay the, the risks and I kind of upplay them because I think they're kind of serious. So it's, it's, uh, the, it's up to each person to decide. Um, I do know people with very early stages who want this drug. Um, the other thing, in addition, in addition to going in twice a month to get an IV infusion, you have to get regular PET scans of the brain, and um, and it's it's so it's very complicated. We're not there yet with drugs. We're just not there yet. But will we get there? I don't know. So I don't try to figure out what drug is best. I like to tell people what you can do to stay healthy, to reduce your risk. And if you do end up getting dementia, luck of the draw, how to live well with it, <laughs> just like if you had something else. So let's see how we can stay healthy, reduce our risk of getting dementia in the first place. And then if we get it, you know, you all know somebody. Some people have lived totally healthy lives and then they die with a cancer. Some people smoke, drink, carouse, don't get any exercise, and they're burying them at 97, okay? <laughs> I get it, I get it. But the odds are in your favor if you have a healthy lifestyle. So that's what we wanna talk about. You've heard this before, and I just heard that some people, Barbara and Cora, to be precise, um, I think it was the two of you. She's our teacher. And you're the teacher. And I encourage everybody to join these two ladies and take that exercise class. And you can tell us about it at the end. Um, <laughs> because, the, the, I mean, I've been talking about this for years. All doctors have, all nurses. Everybody talks about exercise, right? But we did it kind of, kind of because it seemed like a good idea. Now the data could not be more compelling. It could not be more compelling. Exercise is so good for body, mind, and spirit. Body, mind, and spirit. What you do for your brain is going to be good for your health. It's going to be good for your bones. It's going to be good for your muscles. Whatever I can do to persuade you to get 30 minutes a day of aerobic exercise 
tell me what it is and I'll use it to persuade you because mm -hmm. this is where it's at for reducing your risk for staying healthy. Now, what, why does it work? Well, it seems to work because it actually increases brain connections. You know, we have billions of, of neurons or nerve cells. They talk to each other, they're connected and those connections improve and increase with exercise. Exercise also reduces stress hormones, the biggest one being cortisol. And cortisol actually shrinks the part of your brain called the hippocampus that you need to remember things. Let's say that again. You find that you're more forgetful under stress? <laughs> Probably your hippocampus isn't working very well. <laughs> but the good news is, the good news is, if you manage that stress, the brain recovers. Mm -hmm. and exercise, and a couple other things I'll tell you about. Exercise is a great thing for reducing cortisol. Now, exercise also improves blood flow through your whole body, and that includes your brain. And particularly with that risk of vascular dementia, remember the one we said used to be called hardening of the arteries? Treating hypertension and exercising are the two best things you can do to prevent getting vascular dementia, okay? So it's really important. People feel better, all kinds of studies, exercise going toe to toe with antidepressants and working just as well for mild depression, clinically significant, but still mild, um, as do like Zoloft or Prozac or Lexapro. These aren't bad drugs. It's just that exercise works as well for mild cases of depression. So I'll be saying it again, but that that's the uh, that's the first thing that I want you to know. The evidence is solid. We now know how much you need to get these good results. And, um, and so uh, this is something we'll talk about. How can you do it? The other thing you need to do is directly exercise your brain, not just your body to get the blood flow going. And that's by doing challenging mental activity. As you might guess, people ask all the time, should I do Sudoku? And I say, hey, I don't know, do you like it? Because you only should do things that you enjoy because otherwise like, no, Sudoku is not gonna do anything for you. If you're like, I hate this Sudoku. <laughs> I don't know why my daughter gave me this book of Sudoku. And, you know, and a lot of parents really do like, they'll do whatever their daughters say. So you'll find these poor parents like going through crossword puzzles, and doing several things. Oh, my daughter's so be good for my brain. Yes, it will. If it challenges you and if you think it's fun and if it doesn't challenge you and you think it's boring or too hard or a drag or just not interesting, give her the book back. <laughs> OK, but learning something new is really good for our brains. I heard a lecture about. Oh, gosh, it's probably 20 years ago now. I was going to say 10, but I think somewhere between 10 and, and 20 years. Um, Actually, I heard it here in Maine. I wasn't living here at the time, but I was here for a conference. And that speaker said, the strongest stimulus, the most potent way, the most effective new skill you can learn to enhance uh, brain activity, what they call neuroplasticity, is learning a new musical instrument. I went home and took up the saxophone. <laughs> this did not please my family or my neighbors. But... Yep. But my brain is working very well. <laughs> so if you, yes, ma'am. We have a wonderful um, dance studio and that here in town. And my daughter danced for years, as did a lot of other people's kids in here. And uh, I was in observing uh, the advanced tap class. They were doing an Irish dance. Ah. And I walked in. And I stood and the instructor never spoke one word and she danced the combination. They auditorily processed it and they fed it back out to her because of that brain body connection. <laughs> and when I mentioned it to her, she said, yes. And uh, every single one of these girls who probably don't like math because of the stereotypes with it 
will do well on their SATs because it's a math connection. Yeah. yeah. It was it was just amazing to me. You know? That's so interesting. Yeah. You know, I'm I'm glad you told us that story. The other great thing about music, in addition to the brain body connection, mm -hmm. is that when we listen to music or play an instrument or sing or dance or participate, our whole brain lights up. Yeah. It's amazing. If you read a book, one part of your brain lights up. Yeah. If you dance, you listen to music, even if you're not learning a new instrument, your whole brain lights up. Music is so powerful. Yeah, thank you for for uh, underscoring that. So we are lucky here in Maine because we do have a commitment as communities to lifelong learning. And I noticed even upstairs that some of the rooms have been dedicated to people who were lifelong learners. And in their name, the children's room was set up and some other space, I think a lab of some kind. I love seeing that because it's such a commitment to the community and to lifelong learning. And this will protect your brain. The other thing that's really important is sleep. Now, sleep patterns, like other things, do change across the lifespan. Our current thinking, it changes from time to time, but our current thinking is that seven to nine hours a night of sleep are optimal for the aging brain. And people often say, who gets seven or nine hours of sleep a night? Well, um, apparently not many people, um, but it is a goal to work towards because when our brains are in repose when we're sleeping, there's a lot of active changes going on with respect to hormones and kind of resetting. It's also really good for our immune systems. There are conflicting opinions about um, whether you can get your number up by taking naps. My read of the literature is that naps are good for you. Naps are really good for you and people should not hesitate to take them. But some old time docs, of course, I'm an old time doc myself now, but some of my colleagues say, you know, if people nap during the day, they don't sleep well at night. That's just not true. And you agree with me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. You see, this lady who runs an exercise class knows I'm telling the truth. So if there's questions about sleep and ways to get sleep, we can do that in the Q&A. But this is a really important part of your overall health plan to get to get sleep. Finally, I said I would tell you some more ways to reduce stress. One is physical exercise, but also getting somewhere between 12 and 20 minutes a day of meditation or mindfulness practice or prayer is really helpful for reducing stress. Again, all of these things I'm telling you are not just like good ideas. They're, they have a strong evidence base behind them because we've been studying this for a while now. And if you don't yet have a prayer, a daily prayer practice or a mindfulness practice or a meditation practice, I encourage you to check out in your local community an opportunity for this. It seems like everywhere I've gone, there's at least one person in the community who's running a mindfulness class or has, you can go to adult ed and learn what this mindfulness thing is all about. And again, happy to answer questions about it, but prayer works as well. It's the, it's the act of being still, staying in the present moment. Even if your mind is kind of wandering, always coming back to the present moment with something kind of automatic, like a mantra that's, that seems to be um, so helpful. Finally, and this again is where we're so lucky in Maine, there's really good evidence that spending time in the natural world reduces stress. Mm -hmm. And I mean quite simply being outside. <laughs> and it's not just like being outside and going for a mindless walk. It's being outside, noticing the green, Noticing the air quality, noticing the smell, listening to the birds, hearing other animal sounds, smell it. It's got to be a sensory embodied experience to get the full benefit out of it. And when we can't go outside and do that, 
for whatever reason. Like maybe it's 90 degrees and really humid. Yeah. <laughs> It is. Even looking out a window, okay, is really good for your brain. It's amazing how good it is for your brain just to look out, look at the sky, it opens psychological space, and if you can be out in it, all the better. 12 minutes a day in nature, measurable reductions in cortisol. So, yeah. Now, we like to think we're so clever with use it or lose it. Like that's, that's, that's really the message of challenging mental activity, right? Use it or lose it. But uh, Hippocrates came up with it first in about 400 BC. He said it in a much classier way. That which is used develops, that which is not wasteth away. Okay, use it or lose it is the way we talk now. Right? That's how they spoke in 400 BC. So the other thing that's really important is to exercise your spirit. Mm -hmm. We talked about mind, body, and spirit. And we also know, and we really learned this during COVID, that when we lost social connection or were more isolated, people had decline in their cognitive abilities. They felt it, uh, as well as depression and anxiety. It's also true that people who live with a sense of purpose and meaning who have something that engages them. It can be family, friends, your farm, your garden, cleaning your house. It can be saving the world. It can be saving the whales. I don't care what your purpose is. But really taking stock of the fact that you have one. That there are people who need you, people who look up to you, people who care about you. Whatever your purpose is, celebrate it. Be mindful of it and and you know, kind of use it, put it at the, the front of the line, if you will. And friends, I think, um, or this notion of social connection also can't say enough good things about. Now, here's where the story gets a little confusing. Everything I've told you so far is like, you can take it to the bank. But when it comes to diet, you may have seen some of you in the paper just last week, I think it was in the New York Times and then it was picked up in a lot of other papers, that a study on something called the MIND diet, which is um, uh, Mediterranean diet, which is fish and oils and nuts and stuff, um, and the DASH diet, dietary approaches to stopping hypertension. They put those together, studied a bunch of people, and it's kind of disappointing. It doesn't seem to reduce the risk of dementia. It does improve cognitive ability. People, their brains work better, but not necessarily um, over the lifespan. So my takeaway on the diet is that the data is really good for overall mind, body, spirit health to have a healthy diet. But don't rely on diet alone to prevent getting dementia because that evidence just isn't there. Now, what are those, what's that look like? What's a healthy diet look like? I think everybody here probably knows this drill. You heard it from your mom, you heard it from your doctors, you hear from your nurses, probably hear from programs from age friendly, I don't know. But Vegetables, five helpings a day, fruits, nuts, seeds, legumes, potatoes, et cetera, et cetera, are the things that we want to eat. Eat cheese, but in moderation. Eat eggs in moderation. Chicken in moderation. Yogurt and red wine. And really try to avoid red meat. Try to avoid sugar-sweetened beverages, anything with added sugar, processed meats, et cetera. You can read that for yourselves. and. With a healthy diet, you can expect better heart function. You can expect better brain function. You can ex you can probably expect better bone function. Um, that eating well is good for our health. There's no question about that. It just doesn't prevent dementia. So far, we haven't found a way to do it. Now, I talked to you about, all right, so we're going to reduce our risk. We're going to live healthy lives because it feels good to do it. Some of us are going to get dementia anyway. And here are some reasons, I think, to be very, very hopeful. 
The World Health Organization has just launched a global campaign to create a more dementia inclusive society. And thanks to our, our friends and uh, the age friendly movement and our aging fellows, age friendly communities, libraries like this one, we're looking for ways to make communities more inclusive in Maine. Next week, or no, in two weeks, there's a new campaign called Reimagining Dementia, Take It to the Streets. Um, and the message there is that people living with dementia and their care partners can continue to grow. And that is absolutely true. There's my research project in the middle there trying to figure out optimal ways to do that. And then the manual, um, which of which there is a copy in this library and every library in the state of Maine, because our grant put it there, um, is a manual that was written by and for people living with dementia, their care partners, and some dementia specialists. I have a paragraph or two in this book, but we make no money on it. I want to be really clear. I'm not promoting it from self-promotion. The really good parts of this book actually were contributed by people living with dementia. People who have gone through the shock, the sadness of getting a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or Lewy body, taking stock, deciding how they were going to live with it, living well, and passing on their knowledge to the rest of us. So it's a wonderful, wonderful manual. It is absolutely free. It's downloadable online but we have some copies here. The um, If you decide to get it printed and shipped to you, it's like 28 bucks or something, but you don't have to. You can read the whole thing online and download it to your Kindle. You can print it if you have 467 pages of paper at home. I don't recommend it. And, uh, and there you go. But it is absolutely wonderful. And it just came out in May. I have great hope that technology is also going to help us, but we're not there yet. I know a lot of people living with dementia who are big fans of Alexa and other voice activated assistants. They like being able to say, even to a disembodied voice, what time is it? What day is it? And not have that person go, oh my God, how many times are you going to ask me? You asked Alexa every 30 seconds what time it is, and she'll just tell you. Mm -hmm. I tell you, people with dementia love it. They truly do. They love it when they say, Alexa, is it time for my medication? And Alexa says, you just took your medication. Or, no, it's not time yet. Or, yes, it is, and tell you the time. 24-7, you can talk to Alexa. She'll never get impatient. Uh -huh. never answered with frustration. And um, I wouldn't have thought that it was so great, but my, the, I work with a lot of people living with dementia. And they love her. Because one of the hard things about living with Alzheimer's disease, say, is if you're you're uh, in an early stage, you're still living independently, your family and friends are helping out, but you're in your home. Uh, dementia is tough, particularly Alzheimer's, because you really will find yourself like in the middle of the day, not sure like what you're supposed to be doing, right? And it's it's hard. It's hard to like, and you go to your calendar and you think, did I do that thing yet I'm supposed to do or what time it is? To have a voice activated assistant there to just keep reassuring you, answering the questions you want answered. I, I can't say enough good things. I also am very hopeful that we're going to, that we're going to be able to figure out, it's not very good yet, but some kind of tracking technology so that people living with dementia can be, be more freely out and about in their communities. But we have a ways to go, but it's one of the things I'm hopeful about. So where are you gonna start after today? First thing you're gonna do, I hope, is leave here with a really positive attitude if you don't already have one. We know that people with a positive attitude about aging, on average, live seven and a half years longer than people with a negative attitude. I love that. Like, all you have to do is say, I got this aging thing. Um, so if you have a more positive self-perception, uh, it can extend your life. Second thing you want, I'd like you to do is to take a personal inventory. Really take it seriously. Sit down with a piece of paper. Write down everything in your life that stresses you out. 
And then look at your list and say, is that under my control? Is that under my control? Is that under my control? <laughs> okay. And if it isn't, cross it out. And if it is under your control, say, okay, I'll leave that one on there. And then in the next column, you're going to say, whom can I get to help me with that? You know, what really stresses me out is having to be with my husband with Alzheimer's disease 24-7, okay? That, I'm, that's not my husband, but I'm just saying that as an example. That, that um, people will often say that, and I'll say, so who else can be with him? Yeah. Who else can spend some time? Oh, he doesn't like it when anybody else mm -hmm. comes. And I say, I do understand that, but he's going to like it a lot less when you're dead. Because people who live with that kind of stress cannot keep going. So I know that you do this care out of love. And if you want to be able to keep doing it, you've got to take care of yourself. So I feel very strongly about this and speak very directly to people about it. So if being a caregiver is one of the stressors, really look at it and say, huh, I heard there was a main respite program. I wonder how you access that. Call your area agency on aging. <laughs> and they'll help you get respite. We all have friends who are always saying, whenever there's an illness or a death, they say, let me know if there's anything I can do, right? How many of us actually let people know what they can do? Right. Yeah, nobody. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's wrong with us. You know, people say things they need, they want us to help. So get very specific. You know what would help? Is if you could come and stay with Bill for two hours so I can go to exercise class. Amen. I know. Yeah. Everybody's got one friend who can do that. And if you don't, call the area agency on aging because they've got friends for you. So personal or bring your friend. Bring them with you. Bring them with you. There are lots of ways to solve it. But I think you get the point, right? Mm -hmm. What you really and there's so much. Oh my gosh, we live in such a difficult age. And there's so much we can't control. We spend a lot of time kind of angst ridden about it. So take your personal inventory, see what you got on your plate. Cross some of it off, get help with the rest of it, and then you will see that it's a little more manageable than adopt a stress reduction strategy. And look at your personal inventory. Are you getting exercise? Are you getting sleep? And which one, which one, not everything, which one thing seems like, oh, it might be kind of interesting to start playing the saxophone. Um, <laughs> figure out one thing, choose one new activity. I would encourage everybody to schedule an annual wellness visit with your um, primary care practitioner. That's uh, something that's provided by Medicare. Um, hasn't quite lived up to its promise for being valuable, but it's a place to start. And while you're there, tell your doctor you want a cognitive screen. They will do a mini cog, give you three objects, ask you to draw a clock, mm -hmm. ask you what those three were. And people who can do all three say, how could that possibly mean anything? I got to tell you that mini cog is good. It is a good screen. If you get two out of three, then chances are pretty good you're going to get the next level up, which is the MOCA, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, another pen and paper test that you'll be doing with your doctor, okay? And that test then will say more clearly one, if there are problems, and two, where the problems are. <laughs> then, if you do a low score on that test, then you can get a workup. Because here's the other thing to know. Sometimes it's the medications that we take that actually interfere with our cognitive ability. So if you, uh, your brain isn't functioning the way you'd like, you're scared to go get a cognitive screen, please go get one. And if there's a problem, insist on a workup. Do not let anybody ever say to you, oh, you're just getting old. Well, what do you expect? You're 90. You say, I expect my brain to work better than this, and I expect you to do a workup. <laughs> it's pretty straightforward, okay? That's what I expect. And um, and so this is really what I hope that, um, that you will take away. Now, this Oscar Wilde quote is always where I end because I know that many of you think like Oscar Wilde. I do anything to get back my youth, except exercise, get up early, or be respectable. <laughs> Thanks so much for your attention. What questions do you have? Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, thank yes, you. Norma, you are most thank welcome. You're you welcome. Um, a couple of years ago, my husband had a couple of uh, small TIAs, I think they're called. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, he, I would say he was pretty forgetful before those even happened, but he's a lot worse now. Mm -hmm. And when he can't get the word that I'm pretty sure I know what he's trying to say, is it all right for me to say it or should I let him continue to struggle? So my recommendation is to ask him that question. Okay. Quite Quite seriously, like say, just like you did to me. You know, sometimes when you can't quite get the word, I think I might know what it is. Would you like me to fill in the blank or give you time? And just and say it just like that, because honestly, for most people, what they what most people um, don't like is everybody sitting there anxiously waiting for them to get the word. <laughs> you know, you can just feel the impatience. And again, as a public speaker, I know this. If I had, I don't think I had any today, but if I had, I like couldn't find the word that I wanted and just see people like, oh my God, is she going to come up with it? <laughs> you know? and, um, and that just makes everybody uncomfortable. So I honestly, when um, I would ask him and, um, or if uh, he's not the kind of guy you can talk to and ask that kind of question, you can also always just try both ways. Okay. Always wait. That would be the first thing I would do is let the person come up with it because it'll be good for their brains. Okay. But if you notice that um, that the waiting for the person is making them more frustrated, then you can ask, um, were you thinking of this or is this the word you want or is this what you were trying to say? And you can fill it in. But so wait first then offer or simply ask him. You're welcome. Before I take another question, I just remembered that we have some door prizes. And uh, and we said that we would um, go one more. Did everybody sign in? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Stand yeah. up and have a stretch. A bit. Stand yeah. up and stretch, guys. I, I, 145. So we have 15 minutes. I realized I ran way over. <laughs> If people need to leave, feel free. I don't. So, um, uh, and I could talk about this all day. So, uh, but do, if, uh, I won't be offended if you say I'm leaving. Um, and so please, please do go if you need We're to. Gonna, uh, I thought so, Barbara. Yeah. Yeah, we're, sl we're cutting into his nap time. Maybe my nap time. Don't finish nap. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. And, um, but for others who, who uh, want to stay and chat a bit, um, while we're saying goodbye to Barbara and Joe, I, uh, I'll mention one thing that just came up about memory, and uh, this might be helpful to someone else as well. If you think about the act of remembering, you have to first pay attention to the thing you want to learn, right? You got to look at this. You got to pay attention, and that's our frontal lobes. Say, so, okay, I want to memorize this poem. You got to look at it. You got to read it. You got to hear it, whatever. Then it has to go into short term memory consolidation. We call it that's that hippocampus. Then it gets sent to long term storage, which is another part of your brain. And then when you want to recite that poem, you got to pull it out. So memory is, is at least a four step process getting it in. Holding on to it long enough to consolidate it, that's called short term, putting it in long term storage and getting it out again when you want it. And if you um, if you have memory problems and they really bother you, but you don't have any dementia cause or anything, it might be worth actually um, uh, you know, talking to a neuropsychologist to see where the breakdown is in what's making it hard for you to remember. Or you can do the self-help version and say, I'm just going to pay closer attention. I think it's a, I'm too distracted. You know, when I try to learn something, I'm trying to do three things at once. Most people, including young people, do not multitask as well as they think they do. And I think the biggest barrier to learning now is the number of inputs that yeah. we get. It is over we are overstimulated and it's hard to zero in on the one thing we might want to know. So anyway, think of memory as a four-step process. Yours might be in the hippocampus. It might be it's the short, oh, hi, I'm paying attention. I'm paying, I know I'm paying attention. 
but I can't seem to hang on to it very long. That might be a short term. That might get better with stress reduction. You know, it's once you kind of understand how the brain works, then you can analyze for yourself what's bugging you the most, and then you can do a targeted intervention. If you don't have that kind of knowledge about how the brain works, you can <laughs> see a psychologist or <laughs> go online or read about it or whatever. But um, yeah, that's, I just wanted to share that with everybody. I'm going to share something. Um, I went back to college when I was 48. Okay. So that was really <laughs> tough. But um, I had some um, test anxiety. Mm -hmm. And what I learned, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that your frontal lobe is where your memory is. And then anxiety blocks it all out. So it's, you can't remember it. It's like, so I would go down probably 10 questions on a test before it kicked in. And then I would go back and think, no problem. Like, why couldn't I get those? But I knew that. So I didn't let it stress me out more. just kept moving through the test. Mm -hmm. So anxiety, stress. It's yeah. huge. Anxiety is huge. Mm -hmm. And it, it does work just like she was saying that, you know, anxiety really interferes with yeah. your frontal lobe function in recall, as well as paying attention to what you want to learn. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so that really is um, very important. And I, I don't know what you were taught, but, you know, what I teach the students is just deep breathing for test anxiety, because you can try it if you want, you don't have to. But if you if you sit on a chair, for an exam, put your hands on your knees, close your close eyes, your eyes. <laughs> and breathe deeply into your belly. Yeah. Okay, three times. Yeah. You cannot stay anxious. No. You can't. And the reason is because of the body mind connection. So when we're anxious, we're like on high alert. I got this test, or I got this, or I got that, whatever it is. We are engaging our sympathetic nervous system, yeah. okay? Which is that old fight or flight or freeze, right? But it's the gotta go, gotta go nervous system. When you you engage the parasympathetic nervous system, yeah. it's called the rest and digest nervous system. You slow it all down. And it basically signals to your brain, chill, I got this. Yeah. Okay. So it's really, it, it, that's one of those tools that we all carry around with us all the time is our breath. And um, speaking of, since we're in a library, I will recommend to you a fabulous book on breathing by a guy named James Nestor called Breath. It is so good. Because he kind of goes in in a in a um, really simplistic, scientific, non-woo woo kind of way <laughs> for people who are like, ah, meditation's not for me. Um, but it's just a great read. It's a great read. Um, he's written two actually. One is breath, and one I think is I don't know uh, free diving or something. But his and he became interested in uh, the breath when he was, he was a journalist and he was sent to, um, you know, cover some story about free divers. Mm -hmm. And um, and it's amazing what they can do. Oh my gosh, <laughs> it really is. You know, they go so deep, so mm -hmm. fast. And anyway, he he became really interested in about you know, what happens to oxygen exchange and so on. But it, it's just wonderful. It's also available if you don't no longer like to read. It's available as a book on tape. Um, and I mentioned you guys know that the libraries and books on tape. But yeah, James Nestor. Uh, well, I'm talking about books. Um, it was also pointed out to me about this book, particularly if you know somebody living with dementia. What's so great about this is that it's not academic. For example... Uh, one person who has dementia um, was quite frustrated by the fact she could no longer do her taxes. Mm -hmm. She used to be a bank vice president or work in banking somehow. And so math was like part of her identity. And it, so it hurt her and it made her sad. And she, that, that was the thing for her that went first. 
But then as she, as she came to terms with it, decided to live well with it, she writes in there something like, um, I was just reminded of this, that she writes something like, um, well, I can't do my taxes anymore. So I've started writing poetry. <laughs> okay. And it's th that's the spirit that imbues this book. So it also has some medical stuff in it. But to me, that's the real beauty of this. If you know somebody who's coming to terms with the diagnosis in particular, also the good tips for care partners. So, What's his name again? James, James Nestor. 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 Yeah. And if, if we don't have it, or if we don't have it with her audio book, um, and we don't have that, which I, I don't think that we do, we can always do the interlibrary loans. It takes about a week, very easy to do. You can do it right at the surf desk or online, whichever your preference is. Do you guys do um, Hoopla or iCloud? We do Cloud Library. Um, I, I am not really familiar with Cloud Library. It's one of those things that I know that we uh, we want to get more people using because we don't have a lot of people using it from our, our libraries. But I don't know if that's on there. They do have a lot of really great books and an app that will actually play the audio books for you so that you don't have to have a CD. So Yeah. Yeah. If you're not familiar with Cloud Library, check it out. It's so good. I am, um, you know, I was paying for um, a subscription to Audible Books, which is also fabulous through Amazon, um, until I discovered that libraries offer two Audible um have two audible libraries. One is called Hoopla, H-O-O-P-L-A. The other is called Cloud Library. And great selection of fiction, nonfiction. Um, and um, our library, I'm in Biddeford, so well, I'm at the MacArthur Public Library. Our library actually has both. They, they got one during COVID and kept the license, and now they've added, um, I guess they added Hoopla. They always had Cloud Library. So, um, yeah, so you can probably see a health plan emerging, right? Get yourself some earbuds, get your favorite book on tape, learn something new, go for a walk. Sit outside. <laughs> Sit outside, right? If, if, it's day, <laughs> right? if it's not good for you to walk and listen, sit outside. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. What did you call that program that? 12 to 20 minutes you said prayer meditation or mindfulness mindfulness so i just google mindfulness yeah, you could. I'll, 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 yes so let me say a word about mindfulness um mindfulness therapies have sprung up everywhere there is an evidence-based program called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction. It's a 12-week program. It costs a lot of money. Um, and um, yeah, and it's very, very good. However, there is also a free app called Headspace um, that is a mindfulness meditation. Mindfulness really, just as the name implies, is Conceptually is nothing more than being attuned to the present moment. That's what mindfulness is. So a mindfulness practice, for example, that I usually have people do in like a few minutes is, you know, you're sitting in a chair, feel both feet on the floor, feel the back of your thighs on the chair, notice if it's hard or soft, feel, feel the back of the chair on your back, keep your hands here, attend to the to the present you listen for three sounds you look for three things you name them okay so for example and then if you have something like this you can also taste something so what you hear in that the thing about mindfulness is that it doesn't it's not so much about the mind as it is about the senses so it's you so for me mindfulness really is the way i live okay when i'm brushing my teeth i'm not thinking about the lecture i have to give i'm brushing my teeth i pay attention to the taste of the toothpaste the water that i'm going to drink the sounds around the house if my dog comes in i pet it you know i don't do, do that um but 
it's um, it's really just a way of grounding yourself in the present moment. And the reason it's so good for the brain is that there's a part of the brain called the amygdala, which is like our alerting part of the brain. And when you're mindful, like when you're embodied, that gives the amygdala a rest. It doesn't have to be on the, the alert, but paying attention to what's going on. In your Pay body. attention. Pay attention. Um, and um, yeah, but so when you look at uh, be discriminating. You said it's called head? What's the head app? Space. Head space. The app is great. If you like people with Australian like accents. <laughs> <laughs> if you ever like like Crocodile Dundee or Russell Crowe, there's a, it, he's got a great voice. Mm. And, and uh, anyway, headspace. <laughs> there is a headspace um, paid version. Mm -hmm. You don't need it. You really don't need it. That's the the, the like free it. one is great, and it's it really is. You'll be amazed. Um, it's fun, and um, yeah. So. But if you Google if you Google mindfulness, really be discriminating because you'll see a lot of people trying to sell you a lot of stuff, and um, and you probably don't need that. I bet the library has some tapes and books. I on actually it. I was thinking about it. I can give you a lot of names on different platforms, everything from podcasts and YouTube to books that we have here at the library, or we can order. Um, I agree with you. There is a lot of snake oil. <laughs> sales folks out there who are on anything yep, yeah they're just trying to make a quick buck but there is also a lot of really really good information that you do not have to pay for out there yeah and it's it's you know it's quality um it's a quality practice but if somebody's saying you too can be mindful for only pennies a day yeah <laughs> click <laughs> go to the next yeah. yeah i think anyone has a cat or any pet, but especially cats, I recommend watching a cat for 10 minutes a day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just watching them, because they are mindful. They are in the present. They're cleaning themselves or looking out a window at birds or just relaxing. <laughs> it's contagious. Yeah, that's that actually is a great tip. That's a good option too. Um, I like to say the exercise class is on Mondays and Wednesdays. It's at the Elks. It's from 8.30 to 9. Um, I'm probably one of the youngest ones there. <laughs> so they're older. We don't do any uh, real jumping around or um, we do stuff with balance. We do stuff with, with chairs. We do stuff with therabands, uh, small weights, very light weights. And we move for a half an hour for a dollar. And it costs you a dollar. Yes. Yes. So Monday, Monday and Wednesdays, Wednesday. Mondays and Wednesdays, 8.30 oh. to 9 at the Yelp. I highly recommend it. And I'm 82. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, absolutely. And she brings Horror, her husband. Right? Yeah. Yeah, she yeah. brings her husband with her. Right. He so I in, yeah. He does. And, and yeah. I invited um, Barb's husband today. Mm -hmm. He was standing back there. And I went, I said, I'd like to invite you to come. He said, oh, okay. Yeah. So then I told Barb. So now she can talk to him about it. Yeah. Good. Just like, bring him right along with her. That's great. And then they'll deserve their nap. <laughs> right. Right. That's right. Yes, yeah, I'm good. good. It's all good. Yeah. To your point about paying attention, I realized, you know, when you're at a small gathering of new people, you're always nervous about remembering people's names. And I realized I would say, and your name, and people would tell me, and I would immediately forget because I hadn't ever really listened. That's you know? exactly right. And, true. and so I've been trying to really listen the first time. It wasn't that I forgot. I just never even got past, you know, my eyeball. And I learned not to be ashamed to say, and by the way, would you say your name again before I leave or if I want to, you know, because why not, you know? Yeah. But I realized I just wasn't, I was pretending, right. but I wasn't really taking it in. Yeah. Well, thank you also for sharing that because I think that is so common. Yeah, yeah. It is so common. And to repeat the name after you hear it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's yeah. funny, you know, I'm, I'm not very good with names and um, and have taken many, you know, sort of self-help online things to do it. And they will say something like, um, ask someone, if you say, and it happens to know her name is Cora. And then you say, could you spell that for me? But, you know, you're saying to people things like, 
Uh, and how are you spelling Mary? <laughs> I know. It seems kind of silly. <laughs> uh, <but> nowadays. <laughs> but nowadays. I, yeah. My right. name's Carol, and I've seen it spelled oh. a dozen different ways. Well, that's funny. Yeah. So I would, should have no trouble I've saying. seen it with Carol, K. How are you spelling it? I, 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 tell, I tell people I'm just plain and simple, Carol. See, no fancy letters. No, yeah, I've seen it with K's. I've seen it with Y's. Same way with just same like the Chrissy and Hans. I've seen it the with same way. Yeah. Yeah. You want C-Y or C-I's? Yeah. yeah, but it's good. But I think it really is about the. I mean, I discovered for myself because I was cute and a lot of people coming up. Hi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I never paid attention. I made eye contact. I was interested in them, but I really didn't pay attention to their names. So another good example of you can't remember what you don't get in. Yeah, exactly. But I'll always remember Cora. And Norma, <laughs> she was sitting where you're sitting. Yeah, yes, she you're was. a newcomer. And um, Barbara and Joe, because they were the first four that came in. And I made a point. I always make a point of trying to remember somebody's name. Um, just a little exercise. I'm just like always exercising. <laughs> I can't take my saxophone around. With me. <laughs> are you? Are you? You can sing now. Even shows now with you? They're performing yeah. anywhere? You might get some noise, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, whatever. Yeah, I have, whatever. It's funny. I actually haven't played since I moved to Maine. Oh. Since I moved back to Maine. I had a great teacher um, in uh, in Vermont, but um, I moved here five years ago to take a job at UNE and uh, <clears throat> couldn't find a teacher. And I was, you know, oh. things happen. And, and um, But every time I give this lecture, I think I'm gonna go get that saxophone get out of my closet. I'm finding a teacher. So yeah. But no, and then when I give a show, Jimmy's Jazz Club, Portsmouth. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. okay. <laughs> All right. I actually do have to get to Portland for a movie. She's so. three and a half hours. Thank, thank you. 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 Thank you.